It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Because I would never, ever do that to you guys. It is a Wisdom Wednesday, presented, of course, by DraftKings. The wisdom today comes from Connie Carberg. Absolutely perfect timing. Connie was the first female scout in NFL history back in the 70s. She has an absolutely incredible story. And with everything going on, at the NFL owners meetings, the inclusion of women into the Rooney rule, the new position that's been added. There is nobody better or more timely to have on the show today than Connie Carberg. So excited for you guys to get to hear her story in uh, momentarily. You do know, though, that we only have one more show this week. I think we'll probably put it out Friday morning, maybe Thursday night. Not sure yet. We'll decide. It'll be Greg Cosell. And boy, oh boy, is there a lot to talk about with Greg Cosell. We'll dive into the old lineman a little bit. Some other things to discuss with him. But we're going to have winners. And I'm not going to forget. We're going to have a spread the word winner via social media. At Ross Tucker NFL. At Ross Tucker Pod. You guys know we're making a push on Instagram for 10,000. A push on Facebook for 10,000. Let's get there. Facebook.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. If you're on it or know anybody that's on it, please like the page. I think that's all you need to do to be one of the followers of it. I don't even know how Facebook works, to be honest with you. Instagram, you guys know how to do that. Just follow me on Instagram at Ross Tucker NFL. Had some ridiculous poke and sushi last night that I posted. You're going to want to see what I posted on that. Then you've got the sponsor confirmation email winner. Take advantage of any of our glorious sponsors that you find on the sponsors page over at RossTucker.com or that we post on social or that you hear me talk about on the show. And then I love giving the cameo style shout out via a YouTube video. You subscribe to YouTube.com slash RossTuckerNFL. And again, all these things, subscription, like you're just hitting the thumbs up button. You're not paying any money or anything. Just hit the thumbs up button, YouTube.com slash RossTuckerNFL. Make any comment, because I see everybody who makes the comment, then I can give you your own personal shout out for whoever you want. Your buddies, yourself, your spouse, your fantasy dudes, it does not matter. You will get a shout out. YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. As promised, we are joined by Connie Carberg, who you should all follow, by the way, on social media at Connie Scouts. I got to be honest with you, Connie, I didn't know that much about you, but I know you follow me and I see you sometimes reply or like some of my tweets. So I started to click on you. I Googled you. I found out more about you. I'm fascinated. <laughs> I mean, it's un- I had no idea that there was a, a female professional NFL scout in 1976 which is just incredible thank you so much for coming on the show well it's my pleasure ross yeah as i said i have followed you for quite a while i I liked all your different things i'm very active on twitter um i know a lot of people probably don't know because it took about another 40 years before it happened again and now the floodgates have opened but back in the 70s the jets were way ahead of their time and as i said i i knew about you with being at princeton and your ball playing days and all that kind of thing. I said my older brother had gone to Princeton, so I always have a soft spot for Princeton people. I love it. I love it. So <laughs> let's start at the start. Um, just your background and your story for how you became the first female scout in NFL history. Sure. Uh, it started when I was always a tomboy playing lots of sports and everything, but there was, was nothing as far as football back when I was growing up. You know, now they have flag football, there's tackle leagues, there's all kinds of stuff. But in the 60s, when I was growing up as a teenager, uh, there was nothing like that. And then my dad and my uncle, the doctors, Nicholas, they became the two team doctors for the Jets. Uh, it was the Titans, then into the Jets. And my uncle, Dr. James, is the one that did Joe Namath's brace all the operations on. My dad was the internist. So I figured I I better start learning about football. So I started doing that about the age of 13. 
started meeting the players, getting into the game. And for some reason, back then, you know, you only had one game on TV uh, on Saturday to watch. You had a Street and Smith um, magazine and things. And I and Bob Hope, actually, most viewers probably don't even know who Bob Hope is, maybe, in this generation. But he always had the All-American team on every year. So I started just picking out players and holding my own mock drafts at the, at the age of 15 and 16. Not exactly knowing why, except that I just loved doing it. And the draft became very big. The Jets won the Super Bowl my senior year. And that was a, that was a great group. And that was the only Super Bowl the Jets have won, Super Bowl three, and a monumental one at that. And then I went off to a girls' college for two years, and something was – I was playing basketball. There were no girls' scholarships at that time. Title IX had not happened. So I went off, and I was playing basketball because I loved it. And But there was something missing. So I transferred to The Ohio State University, best move I could have made. Um, I started – I. I, you know, I was going to games and stuff. And one day I went over to the union, waited outside with a book called You Win With People by Woody Hayes. And Coach Hayes, as you know, was very well known back then. Um, and he couldn't have been nicer to me. I told him about my love of sports. I didn't know what to major in. I didn't know what I was doing. And so he said, you know, come on over and we'll meet at the stadium. We did. He proceeded to say, right now there's nothing. There's just nothing. There were no women sideline reporters, no women and scouts, no coaches. No, you know, you name it. Phyllis George had not even started on the NFL today. So it was a very different world. And he said, but you know, you have such a passion. Don't stop loving it. Don't stop following it. You never know in life where things are leading you. And he was so right. He said, you, you need to come to practice anytime you want, whether it's open or closed and talk to the scouts, talk to players. You can come in anytime. He was amazing to me. And so I did that. My sorority sisters would do my work for me. <laughs> and so I could go over and practice every day. And then from there, graduated. I thought I was going to teach, which I had a job at Babylon High School where I used to go. And then I was going to just coach girls sports. I graduated in 74. And Title IX is just starting, coming into being there. And then my father had a birthday party and Charlie Winter was the head coach. So he, I sat down next to him. We started talking football and he said, we're building a new complex and you love football. You have a passion I've, I've never seen before. Would you consider working for us? And that's how it began. So I was the only woman in the building, receptionist and scouting secretary in the building. And then it grew as time went on, but in 74. And then I had a wonderful boss named Mike Hollaback. And he was a genius to me at um, I, I was very lucky with, I grew, I grew up with Walt Michaels, who was a defensive coordinator of Super Bowl three. He was one of my mentors. I had a teacher in school that was football coach. That was a, a game to the games with us that taught me a lot. I had a lot of great male mentors. And then, as I said, when I went to work, Mike Hollaback taught me a lot. And the Jets, if you go back and look at 1976, 1977, and just see the players in those two drafts that were the basis of the Jets actually getting to an AFC championship game, even though Don Shula didn't put the tarp down, um, that it was really amazing because from Marvin Powell to Wesley Walker to Joe Klecko to Abdul Salam, I can go on and on with Richard Todd. I can go through the whole list of guys. And so, but in 75, we had the draft and it was 17 rounds at that time. And we got to the 17th round and Al Ward was our general manager, Mike Hollaback, my boss. And he said, okay, you're going to make the last pick. So they had me actually make a draft pick. So I, the only woman to still ever make an actual draft pick. And I chose Mike Bartosik out of Ohio, the Ohio State University. And after that, I just started doing other things with, with more and more with the scouting department. And one day Al Ward and Mike Hollaback, um, we were eating, we were doing game plans. We did them back in the locker room in those days. And he said, we're very, uh, we like what you do. Would you consider scouting for us? I went, are you kidding me? Sure. And, th but they didn't make a big deal of it. So uh, Dick Young, who was a great writer in those days. And when I went to Ohio state to scout, they did articles. Um, and so I did all the scouting, you know, with them back then and writing reports, interviewing players, real to real, uh, doing stuff. So that's how it all began. That is awesome. Um, <laughs> I love that story. So, the thing that's so interesting to me about you, Connie, is I, when, as I was researching you, knowing your athletic background, knowing how much you love football, I was stunned that 
you majored in home economics because it just seems so counter to all the other. You are versatile, Connie. It was, I kind of like, almost like throwing a dart. You know, I didn't know what to major in when I was at the all girls liberal school. Then when I went to Ohio State, I said, what? Well, I'll put in the home ec and dietetics and nutrition. And I thought that way I'll get my degree with the education and I can coach girls sports. But it was, as you said, the antithesis of what I was as a tomboy. And all that kind of stuff. So it, it was really funny. But as I said, I had great sorority sisters that did a lot of the stuff for me. <laughs> and I was able to go to practice. And that's where my passion was. And Coach Hayes saw that and did not discourage it. And this is back, remember, this is back in 1971 to 74. So we have to place ourselves back in those times, you know, pre-computers, pre-Title IX, um, you know, pre-cell phones, you name it. It was a very, very different world. So cool. So um, I got to I got to ask you, what were the difficulties in being the first female scout? I have to imagine there had to be some people that didn't think it was a good idea or didn't like it or maybe gave you a hard time. You know, Ross, I was really lucky. I, I don't know if ignorance is bliss or what, but growing up with it and with the players and the Jets being my whole basically my life I and mean, just my whole passion and everything. I felt very comfortable talking football and it just, for me, didn't seem out of the ordinary. And, you know, as I said, I was very lucky having these kind of male mentors. They, they were unbelievable to me that they did not say, Hey, there's nothing like this right now. As I said, Phyllis George started doing stuff and then Jane Kennedy, but there really wasn't anything else in that respect. But I was very, very lucky. Um, I knew a lot of people when I was a receptionist, then doing the scouting, um, so as I said, I, I, I thought that's the only place that I really had confidence. I wasn't confident in myself in a lot of other respects. And plus I didn't know how to be a secretary. I had no idea how to shorthand, how to type, but <laughs> luckily they didn't, they didn't hire me. I was gonna say they didn't draft me, but they didn't hire me for that reason. They hired me for my love. And like if somebody walked in the door or something was happening, I knew who everybody was what teams they were, what coaches they were for, the announcers, if it was Hank Stram, I didn't matter who it was. And they could feel very confident in, in that respect. How cool is it for you to see, I guess it's kind of a two-part question. The first one is, it feels like, Connie, it was another 40 years yeah, before cool. more women started getting, I mean, if you started in 76, I'm going to say, I didn't really notice women getting opportunities till 2016. Yes. So let's start with that. No. Um, just wh why? I mean, if you got in in 76 and you were doing a good job and people knew you, uh, I guess I'm kind of stunned that there was no one else for 40 years. That's a heck of a long period of time. Well, go as I said, first of all, going back to that, that place in time, it was very, very different. And even... Mr. Hess, who was the owner of the Jets, had, after a while said, I can't have a woman really traveling around. And I, and I understood it because at that time, he's 70 years old. He's from a really different generation, a great guy. But he said, you can still grade paper. You know, you can still grade films. And that time, as I said, it was real to real. You can still go locally and stuff like that. So in that respect, it was a little different. But then uh, Ralph Wilson, who was the owner of the Buffalo Bills, he had um, a daughter, Linda Bogdan, and she did a lot of different things for him, including later on, my brother was working for the Bills while I was working for the Jets, so we made sure we didn't have uh, nepotism. <laughs> and so um, she, she, she did some stuff in the 80s, but uh, I, so I was in the 70s. And then after that, it just got kind of quiet. And then all of a sudden, I would have to say Bruce Arians kind of broke everything through. When he took had Jen Welter come in and hired her as an intern coach, that was like the first step. And then the way things are in society today and all that kind of thing, and plus – with social media, everything gets blown up. When the Jets did it with me, you have you have maybe three or four beat writers covering you all the time, and they knew me since I was a kid. So it wasn't this big, huge thing made of it. So I think that's probably why it was more. And the Jets were just ahead of time. They really were. I give them so much credit. And so then I think that's what took it. But Bruce Arians broke through. Then the Jets, they had three um, girls uh, the following year that were interns in scouting. One of them was Callie Bronson, who's now chief of staff at the Browns. So, but then I think it just kept going and going. And now it's come to the point where it's really very, very common. It's amazing. It's got to be such a good feeling for you. 
It really is. I said, I, I didn't know how big it was until my son made my website. He made the Connie Scott. He said, I just want it there, mom, so that uh, this way we can put it in and put the little things in that you didn't, you were the first female scout. So no, that nobody has to worry about anything else. And that's all we did. And all of a sudden, as you can, as you know, Ross, right? Last 10 years, how social media has just blown up and podcasts and people talking and Jets Twitter. Of course, I just love Jets Twitter. And um, just everybody, you can, you can be in touch. Like I moved to Florida after I got married and moved to Florida. But I could still now I can still stay in touch with all the writers, the beat writers, you can stay in contact with all the Jets people. The Jets still treat me like family when I go up every summer for three weeks. I spend three weeks at training camp. I have for 55 straight years till the pandemic, um, you know, ruined one year. But I went last year again. But they, as I said, they've been amazing, amazing to me. So that's the other thing I noticed, Connie. You got married and you got out of it. That had to be tough. You know, I was very like, I, while I was working there and we had this thing where I helped find Mark Gastineau while I was, it was, it was my big thing. But, I, and I met my husband right around that time and he had a job offer down in Florida. So we, he said, but you're going to make the decision because we went down and they kind of like wined and dined us, how, you know, Florida with the palm trees. And he said, let's go back home first. And then you have to make the decision. Do you want to leave? Because it had been eight years and um, I was a man and I'm madly in love with him and everything else. And I said, you know, this is, I think we can start family and, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, you know, you never know really when you're making a decision, if it's right or wrong, it all worked out really well. But at the time it was a very big decision to leave the Jets. Cause that was, as I said, my whole identity and my life. Connie, you're even awesomer than I thought you would be. I know it's not a real word, but I'm throwing it out there anyway. You're even more awesome than I thought you would be. I guess the last question I would ask you, what's the biggest thing about scouts or scouting that you think my listeners or the people that watch on YouTube, that they wouldn't know that they just, they just wouldn't know. Cause it, it doesn't, people don't, it doesn't get publicized. Wow, Is there cool. something that you yeah. had to do or that scouts do that people don't really know about? Well, as I said, there's so much more than just the measurables, you know, the height, weight, and speed that sets, certain scouts first of all they have to travel so much you got to really love what you're doing and they're on the road except for a uh, part of the month of either june or july and then when they come in for the draft so they either have to have a very understanding significant other or be single because <laughs> it's a you know you're on the road a lot so but i think it, it, it what sets them apart because now everybody has their cell phones right so you can say height weight and speed everybody's got their mock drafts and everything there has to be something that you can find out when you go to these schools and what the scouts have to do. You know, they may have to walk into a delicatessen and the guy there says, oh, yeah, I serve, you know, Joe Schmo all the time. And, oh, man, I don't like him. Or, yeah, man, he is awesome. What a great young man. Or And somebody else might say, you know what? I know someone who's a trainer there. Use my name. Football and the NFL are like a big fraternity. And once you know somebody, somebody else knows. So I think that's the probably the biggest thing is how much work goes into it, not just going and writing reports, but finding things out, maybe a little nuggets that somebody else doesn't have, especially nowadays when we have social media with everything on it. Check her out on social media at Connie Scouts, the great Connie Carberg. She's fantastic. There's a book. There's a whole NFL network thing. She's famous <laughs> now, uh, but not famous enough because not enough people know about you. Connie, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. I was honored when you said that you would speak with me, Ross, and everything because you're big time. <laughs> so I really, I'm really enjoying this. And thank you so much. And uh, as I said, go Princeton Tigers too. Connie was awesome. I knew she would be. But just what an amazing, appreciative person she is. What a terrific attitude. I am beyond impressed by both women that we've had on the show this week. Colleen Wolf on Sunday night. Connie Carberg this morning. Just incredible, incredible women that love football. And I love people that love football. I also love the Final Four. I'm a huge Final Four guy. This is going to be awesome. Kansas Nova, Duke UNC. Do you know you can play free pools all March long for a shot at a share of over $250,000 in prizes if draft sport if DraftKings sportsbook isn't available in your state yet. So even if DraftKings sportsbook isn't in your state, 
you can join the college hoops action with these DraftKings pools. Simply join a pool and answer questions like, who will make it to the next round? Who will hit the most three-pointers? Then track your results. Or you can download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code ROSS. Bet $5 on any college hoops team to win this weekend. So it could be any of the ones I mentioned. And you get $200 in free bets if they do. If they win, you win with promo code ROSS this week at DraftKings Sportsbook. 21 or older, of course. Restrictions apply. We talk about those restrictions at the end of every single show we do here on the Ross Tucker Podcast Network. Tux Takes. Hi, Ross. Good morning. Let's start with the NFL owners meetings. Uh, first up, all 32 NFL teams must hire minority uh, coaching, minority offensive coaching moving forward in the Rooney Rule expansion. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. So this is interesting because this is essentially the Peter King idea. And I think we had Peter on the show and discussed it. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a really good expansion of the Rooney rule. Here's the deal. Everybody wants to hire the hot shot play caller. Everyone wants to hire the McVeigh, the LaFleur. Maybe you could say the Zach Taylor, the guy that is an offensive guru who can maximize what your quarterback does for the team and put the team in a schematic advantage. Well, if that's the case, then if we want to increase minority hiring, they need to be offensive gurus. They, they need to be on really, and, and maybe even more specifically, they need to be with the quarterbacks. The people that coach the quarterbacks are the people becoming head coaches in the NFL for the vast, not all of them, Vrabel, Sala, not all of them, but that's certainly your best path to being an NFL head coach right now is to be a, a quarterback guy. Uh, Kevin O'Connell, right? Just got hired by the Vikings. So I think this is a really good idea. Honestly, I don't know if somebody told Peter the idea or this was his idea, but to me, this is like the Peter King rule. Tux takes. The other big news out of the owners' meetings, they approved the overtime rule change, so both teams are going to get one possession. This is gigantic. I'm on board with it. What I Look, you guys know I, I've been – long outspoken. I never thought there was an issue with overtime in the first place. I was fine with sudden death. Never heard a player ever complain about it. You had 60 minutes to win the game. If it extends, then I think they should try to end the game. However, in the playoffs, because it's just for the playoffs right now, and let's hope it stays just for the playoffs, quite frankly, they should go back to sudden death for regular season. And But for the playoffs, both teams get one possession. What I think is really interesting, and I tweeted about this yesterday at Ross Tucker NFL, and I'm looking forward to asking Steve Fezzik about this next week on Even Money Podcast since he is the numbers guru, analytics, he knows the odds. I wonder how many teams are going to take the ball first and how many are going to elect to kick. If you elect to kick, number one, they shouldn't have very good field position. They should get the ball, you know, around the 25 at best. Number one. And number two, you know you're getting a possession. So they get nothing. All you need is a field goal. They get a field goal. You can get a field goal to tie or a touchdown to win. They get a touchdown. You can get a touchdown and go for two if you want. So I think there's an advantage to going second, to actually kicking. And I think some teams will pick that unless you think both teams score a touchdown and just kick the extra point. If you believe that one of the team, at least one of the teams is going to go for two, I think there's a pretty big advantage to going second. So I think that is going to add a lot of intrigue. We'll see how many overtime games there are next postseason. This past year was just amazing. But I think that really adds something to it. And I, I like it because I do think teams will go for two. So I don't think it'll extend it that much because I think the team that's let's say let's say it's Mahomes and the Chiefs against Josh Allen and the Bills. I do think that if the Bills had gotten the ball and they went down and scored, I do think they would have gone for two. And then the game would have ended one way or the other. I like that. 
I, I like that a lot. I'm happy about this for the playoffs, and hopefully people can stop talking about it. My concern was if it goes to a third possession, then whoever won the coin toss ends up, you know, getting the benefit of that anyway. But the way it will go now, I actually think it'll be okay. I think some teams will choose to, to kick, and I don't know how many third possessions we'll even get to. Tux takes. Speaking of those Buffalo Bills, they're getting a new stadium, $1.4 billion, $600 million of it coming from New York State, another $250 million coming from Erie County. So I know people have – I got a lot of different thoughts on this, okay? First of all, absolutely thrilled for the people of Buffalo and Western New York. Rochester, you know who I'm talking to. My beloved Bills fans, I make no mistake – um, of the fact that I have a soft spot in my heart for Western New York, for the Bills, for Bills fans. You guys know I'm pretty transparent about that. I'm so excited for them. I mean, this locks the Bills into being in Buffalo for a long, long time. That's number one. The second part of this, the public money, You, I think you know my philosophy by now. If I'm not very knowledgeable about something. I don't pretend that I am. I believe strongly that local municipalities benefit greatly from having an NFL team, the revenue it brings in, et cetera. No question in my mind. The, and I took classes on that in college, actually. I think the real question is how much? How much do they benefit? I've seen where Joe Banner, who was instrumental in it at uh, Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia, feels like this is too much money from the government and that they absolutely should pay some, but this is too much. The point I've always made is if Buffalo or New York State or Erie County weren't willing to do this, somebody else would be. People want NFL teams. And that's not a threat. That's just, we've seen it. That's just the reality of the way it works, right? Like, you know, maybe it's St. Louis. I don't know. But there would be people, there would be other cities more than willing to pay uh, for a lot of the stadium to have an NFL team move there. And I think that's the reality of the situation, right or wrong. Tux Takes. Detroit Lions are going to be featured this summer on Hard Knocks, and Detroit's also going to host the 2024 NFL Draft. Yeah, what's going on, man? The Detroit Lions are getting, and I think a lot of this is Dan Campbell. I think Dan Campbell and his personality and the excitement around the Lions franchise with just the way they played last year, even though their record wasn't good, it was the way in which they went about things. I think people are excited about it. I'm happy for Detroit that they not only get the draft, but they get hard knocks. And I'll watch that. My former teammate, Dan Campbell, awesome dude. Looking forward to it. Tux takes. Josh McDaniels had some comments on Derek Carr's contract. That's kind of getting him in a bad position. Quote, Derek has to make a decision. What's best for him. We have to do what's right for the team. Your thoughts. Right. He went on to say, hopefully there's a sweet spot where both those things work. You know, this is part of the issue with Josh McDaniels. And you can say it doesn't matter. He didn't say anything wrong. He's, he's just speaking the truth. Derek Carr's agent came out and tweeted something within 30 minutes of that. He didn't care for it. So if you're Josh McDaniels, he, he did this with Jay Cutler. He's already said something publicly that has now annoyed Derek Carr and Derek Carr's agent. Why? Why does Josh do these things? I, I, I know Josh. I like him. I don't understand. I think he thought maybe that that was, uh, and you know, a fine comment, but he's basically putting it out there. Derek should take less for the team. I mean, that, that's the perception that people will have from that comment. And it was just a really unnecessary public comment from Josh. He, he does not handle some of these situations as well as he should. 
Tux takes. We talked about Ryan Bates last week. Uh, who was it? Baltimore? Chicago. Or Chicago. Well, anyway, the Bills matched the four-year $17 million deal. I, mean, I might have even talked about that Sunday night. Thrilled for Ryan. Called his high school games. I mentioned that Sunday night. I think he probably wanted to stay with the Bills. You know, he's been there for three years. They've got a good team. He's established himself as a starter. And for the Bills, that's a good contract to match. I mean, it's like $4 million a year or something. Uh, that's for a guy that's going to start for you at guard probably for four years and has versatility to play other spots. It's kind of a no-brainer. Tux takes. A couple of signings. The Saints re-signed Traquan Smith. They signed quarterback Andy Dalton. Cardinals signed guard Will Hernandez. Steelers, Gennard Avery. Jets signed Solomon Thomas. And the Pats signed Jabril Peppers. Right. These are teams kind of adding depth before the draft. You know, guys that they think might be able to help them. I think Avery's best fit in as a Steelers 3-4 outside backer. We'll see what Belichick can do with Peppers. Solomon Thomas used to play for Robert Sala in San Francisco. Will Hernandez used to play for Sean Kugler, the Cardinals O-line coach in college. Remember, lifelines. We, I always tell you guys, I just want a big reason why I stuck around as long as I did, lifelines. I had a lot of lifelines out there, people that knew me and liked me as a player and as a person. That's why these guys are getting signed. And the Saints absolutely had to bring back Traquan Smith. Andy Dalton to New Orleans is interesting because I don't know how much of that's because of Jameis's knee, Jameis Winston's knee, and how much of it is in case he falters and starts turning the ball over like crazy again. Tux takes. One other signing, it's the Baltimore Ravens signing head coach John Harbaugh to a three-year extension. What a run he's been on, man. I think if he fi finishes this three-year extension, that'll be 18 years in Baltimore. Well-deserved. I mean, he, he's a very, very good football coach. Last year was obviously a disappointment. I'd be surprised if there isn't a major bounce back for the Baltimore Ravens this year. Tux takes. And finally, the Philadelphia Eagles are going to rock those Kelly Green uniforms, not in 2022, but in 23. Right. Their owner, Jeffrey Lurie, said this upcoming year they'll have a black alternate uniform with a black helmet. And then in 2023, I guess for a game, that's what I grew up on. Randall Cunningham, Reggie White, absolutely awesome. Anybody my age just loves that color scheme. It just looks beautiful. There's something about Kelly Green. So kudos to the Eagles and Jeffrey Lurie. Kudos to all of you guys that are already thinking about Mother's Day for your significant other or your mom or any of the moms in your lives. And you've already gone to myfrontpagestory.com to just check it off your list and get your mom or your wife, the greatest Mother's Day gift of all time at myfrontpagestory.com. And kudos to all of our patrons, patreon.com slash RT Media, including Evergreen Economics, go-bangles.com, steakhousesports.com, humanheadnyc.com, sportaculture, and pizza boy brewing. Check out the Fantasy Feast. Check out Even Money, College Draft, and of course, we'll have Greg Cosell to wrap up the week. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found. A lot of times on the show, I mentioned DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100 Gambler or in Indiana, 109 with it. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, it doesn't always. Sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in site credit. 